This is KGW News at Noon. Welcome to the News at Noon. I'm Drew Carney standing alongside Rodney Hill because Rod, uh, weather is our big story here this afternoon, specifically the winds. Yeah, so the front right now is actually pushing into the uh, Willamette Valley. Here's a look at uh, where the current wind speeds are. And we still have the wind advisory in effect up and down I-5 from Eugene all the way north up into Cowlitz County. I mean, not horrible stuff, but certainly catching your attention are the wind speeds. South of 33, McMinnville. Hillsboro 26 has been gusting into the 30s. Aurora, you had a 40 mile per hour wind gust earlier, right now to 29. And there you see Trotdale that had an east wind has kicked to the southwest at 22 and PDX is at 22. Wider vantage point. One big headline is that the coast wind warning has been canceled. So the front has moved inland. We had 50 mile per hour winds in Newport now all the way down to 23. But you can see the wind field's pretty extensive. Bend at 39 under a wind warning for potential 55 mile per hour winds yet this afternoon. Most areas are seeing some rain. It's been very steady, more than not here on the west side. The warning map, notice again, the coast warning is gone, but the wind advisory for the valley continues, as does an advisory for winds today out in the Dalles and the warning in central Oregon. I think the 30 to 45 mile per hour wind threat for Portland, Salem, and Vancouver at the latest will start to get out of here at 2 o'clock. So we're really kind of almost done. Spotty power outage is still a potential. We're at 58 degrees. If you have plans this evening, it's much calmer. The rain will be coming increasingly scattered. Um, and we have more rain coming for the weekend. And that's seven-day forecast. And some wind reports for you, too, coming up. All right, Rod, you mentioned the rain and the rain is also part of our next story here this afternoon because rain has the Oregon Office of Emergency Management talking about the potential problems from flooding and landslides. The big concern comes from areas that were hit with recent wildfires. Those wildfires burned vegetation, charred soil and formed a layer on the surface that rainwater can't penetrate. The runoff can be really damaging to roads. So the bottom line here is to be prepared when you're driving and always have an emergency kit ready to go. Think about the kind of things that you're going to need to be self-sufficient for a couple of days, up to 14 days after an emergency or a disaster, and start preparing that emergency kit. Extra food, extra water, extra medication. You can also sign up for emergency alerts at oralert.gov or check local roads by going to tripcheck.com. It's been 14 months since last year's historic wildfires in Oregon, and some families are still really struggling to get back on their feet. So the federal government is now giving more money to the state to help with long-term recovery. Christine Pitawanich has more. I'm a single mom with four kids, so I'm a busy, busy bee. Home these days for Hallie Weir and her four kids is a hotel room. If you look over here, you got Elise's little bed over here. Over here is our little like get ready area and clearly you can tell there's three teenagers and a mom. She and her kids have been living out of a hotel since May. Before that, they were crashing at a friend's farm. The wildfire that burned through the Santiam Canyon in September of 2020 left her and her then boyfriend without a home. I've been applying for FEMA since the beginning. We filed multiple appeals and it's just a process. I think that is the hardest part, is not having a place that's your home. But there is additional help on the way. Oregon is expected to get more than $422 million from the federal government. Much of it will be geared toward helping low and moderate income families get housing. My name is Frank McNally. I'm the Deputy Director of the Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division in the Office of Community Planning and Development at HUD. McNally says the money is part of the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Community Development Block Grant Program. Any activity that is eligible under the Community Development Block Grant uh, Program is also an eligible use of our funds. Um, and that would generally fall into the buckets of housing, uh, infrastructure, and economic development and mitigation. In Oregon's case, affordable housing for people whose homes burned remains an area of huge need. We are going to work really hard to meet all the re federal requirements uh, and try to to use these funds as as fast as we if we possibly can. But, Delia know. Hernandez is with Oregon Housing and Community Services, the state agency that'll be in charge of distributing the money. 
it's still uh, the beginning of a long and complex process. We're going to develop an action plan that'll identify how we'll use the funds. Hernandez says people will also be given an opportunity to weigh in on their needs. That's going to be one of the core factors uh, on deciding how we use these funds. But all that will take time. I see it as a positive outlook having money come, but you know, not knowing the timeline makes it really hard. How long right. is it going to take? I mean, it's a widely shared criticism of the program that it takes too long. In the end, while the money is expected to be a big help, it could be months before the paperwork is done, plans are finalized and put into motion. We're all trying really hard to move forward. And it's starting to feel like, you know, one step forward, two steps back. And I really hope that that money goes where it's supposed to because I know a lot of people that would benefit from it. In total, $5 billion has been designated to help states recover from disasters in 2020 or 2021. So far, more than $2 billion of that has been allocated to nine states and Puerto Rico. There's a whole formula to calculate a state's level of need, and with 2020's wildfires, this is the first time Oregon has met the threshold to get this kind of help. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. Our top COVID headline this afternoon remains the fact that kid-sized doses of the Pfizer vaccine are now allowed in both Oregon and Washington. The FDA, the CDC, and the Western State's Scientific Safety Review all say the vaccine is safe and effective for kids 5 to 11. KGW's Alma McCarty has more on this with doctors from the Oregon Health Authority. To the north of us in Seattle, dozens of kids got their first dose of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine Wednesday, less than 24 hours after the federal stamp of approval. Back home, expect some initial delay as Oregon providers receive the vaccine shipments in the coming days, but a smoother rollout than it was for adults. OHA estimates there are 330,000 vaccine-eligible children in this age group in the state. We expect our health care system will not be able to accommodate all children who'd like to get vaccinated in the first few days that they become eligible. Families will be able to find appointments or drop-in services in the coming weeks if they're flexible and check with their primary care provider, nearby pharmacies, and other sources. Dr. Kristen Dillon with the OHA says they'll have enough doses for the next four to six weeks statewide and will supplement areas of high demand with incoming doses. This is a two-dose series with three um, weeks in between, and you don't get full protection until two weeks after. But I you know, hope that you know, we will see a significant number of um, children get vaccinated in the coming week. Dr. Dean Seidlinger, the state's epidemiologist, tells me he expects many families to head to their pediatrician or primary care provider. So we anticipate that after this initial rush, that's where the vast majority of vaccines will be given, um, where you take your child to get care, where you take your child to get a checkup. Both doctors say that's also a really good place to get any of your lingering questions answered. And write them down, ask your provider with your next visit, um, because we want parents to be assured that, you know, no steps were cut in, in um, having this vaccine authorized for use in younger children. The Kaiser Family Foundation has done a great job of tracking this over time is about a third of parents are eager to have their children uh, vaccinated right away, they say. About a third of parents are saying they're going to wait and see. And then there are a decent uh, proportion of people who, who do have a lot of concerns and questions. Concerns and questions are welcome, but they want to make it clear. The vaccines are effective, they're safe, and the kid-sized doses are only a fraction of what is given to adults. One of the main reasons is to prevent um, increased side effects in this um, age group. One more note on this story. Health leaders say a lot of the mass vaccination sites that are going to pop up here soon will allow everyone in the family to get their shots or booster shots all at the same time. You can find a vaccination uh, clinic near you by going to getvaccinated.oregon.gov. All right, next stop here on the news at noon is Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler's announcement about a series of steps that he says are absolutely needed to deal with the crime and gun violence issues in the city. And those steps include hiring 200 police officers in the next three years and getting body cameras for police. The mayor said the money for more cops and those body cameras would come from a one time city surplus of $62 million. And he wants $7 million of those dollars spent on police. As a leader of this city,
what these families and the greater community want and need from me and the city council is increased action and better results. In that announcement, the mayor also proposed paying retention bonuses for police who are already on the force and giving hiring bonuses of up to $25,000 for the first 50 officers who qualify. He also wants to hire another 100 unarmed officers who would respond to less dangerous calls. This plan does still need approval from city council, but the mayor believes he has the votes to make this happen. Well, we mentioned Washington County's ban on flavored tobacco on yesterday's News at Noon, and we're bringing it up again today because we had the chance to talk to a local business owner about it. He says the plan is going to put him out of business. Christopher Ferreria is the owner of Oregon Vape Shop in Hillsboro. And since most of what he sells is flavored tobacco, he's afraid that he's going to have to close up shop when this ban begins next month. Ferreria says he agreed with the initial intention of the ordinance, basically to keep flavored tobacco away from kids, but he says the all-out ban is too much. The original language for this ordinance had merit and was correct, but it turned into a gross overstatement at this point. The American Cancer Society, on the other hand, says a ban like this is critical to keeping these products away from kids. In fact, these are the exact words from the American Cancer Society saying data shows that menthol cigarettes and other flavor products like e-cigarettes are intentionally targeted at kids, communities of color, and low socioeconomic groups.